SCP-093 Mirror Test 3 Color Violet Subject is D-84930 Male, 21 years of age, average physique Subject's background shows instance of second-degree murder of a police officer during a drug bust. Normally this crime, while severe, would not qualify a person for a sentence that would end up with us, but the murder of the officer was especially brutal and excessive violence was used. This subject was uncooperative and had to be reminded that his cooperation would only benefit him. Subject entered the provided mirror while holding SCP-093, which emitted a violet color. Outside technicians observed that the mirror retained a true reflection until subject had completely passed into it, at which time the view changed to a cityscape, urban, lightly tinged in purple, similar to the first test. Video feed follows in attached media. Camera flickers to life and pans around the area. Subject is in what appears to be a modern downtown district similar to a city like New York. The streets are mostly bare except for a few cars of unknown make or model. These cars look highly advanced and streamlined. Subject attempts to look into the car windows without being instructed to, but backs away remarking there is a rank ass stank coming from the areas around most of them. Subject is persuaded to move closer to one car, and does so with coughing, <laughs> wiping off a window which is covered in dirt. The inside of the car appears to be completely filled with a strange brown matter. There is nothing at all visible other than the brown matter. Two other cars produce the same results, however a fourth vehicle seems more recent than the others, and the insides are immaculate. The doors to this vehicle also are unlocked, and Subject quickly gets inside then shuts the doors. Subject is chastised for this behavior by Control, who reminds him his lifeline is nothing more than a cable, which is sturdy enough that closing the car door does not injure it, but they cannot recover a person in motion. Subject argues with Control over this issue and pans the camera across the dashboard, pointing out that he couldn't drive away even if he tried. The dashboard is void of any recognizable controls. No ignition, no steering. It has several small blank screens that are theorized to be a GPS system. Subject remains in the car while Control discusses how to proceed since the city landscape is far larger than the previous test destinations. Control debates this issue while Subject stares around the cityscape from the car. During one pan, a face is clearly seen staring into the car eyes watching the subject. However, this was not noticed until post-test footage reviews. Subject made no comment regarding this entity at any point. Control shortly after informs subject to remain where he is, and an escort team is dispatched through the mirror to join him. A team of four armed personnel is sent through the mirror and proceeds to subject's location. Subject is then instructed to remove his harness, which is recovered. The subject's video feed then ends and is replaced by a wireless unit used by the escort team. The video quality on this unit is subject to more interference, but in order to mark the mirror exit, a receiver system is placed through the mirror. Subject leaves the car and now travels with the escort team. Given the myriad of possible options, they are instructed to simply move to the closest building and attempt to enter it. This building has etched glass doors bearing the name XEA Research Partners Incorporated, and the doors are ajar. A magnetic lock system is present but has lost power. Team enters the building and main lobby. This area resembles a stereotypical corporate lobby. There is a C-shaped receptionist desk with a chair pushed far from it as if it was left in a hurry. A PC terminal is at the desk as well. Team approaches the desk and the camera bearer is instructed to examine the PC. The unit does appear to have power and Faithful OS appears on the screen requesting a login and a password. A keyboard is present but is remarkably slim with touch sensitive keys rather than press down keys. After one failed attempt the lock screen replies that maximum attempts have been exceeded 
and the PC turns off. No actual tower or power button can be located, so team moves forward. Behind the receptionist desk are two elevator doors, one to the left and one to the right, with similar touch sense keys. The elevator on the left is broken, the door open and the shaft empty. The elevator on the right appears functional and has power. Without a clear destination, the team is instructed to proceed to the highest floor to get a lay of the city. All floors appear to be accessible, with the highest being 114, in reality 112, as 13 and 113 are missing from the keypad. Journey up the elevator is uneventful during this time. The elevator does appear to take longer as it passes by 13 and then 113, suggesting that entire floor was built and nothing put on it. At 114, the doors open and the team enters a large lounge type area. There are many couches with dust on them. A widescreen, apparently LCD TV of approximately 60 plus inches in size dominates the wall in front of them with no power. A series of windows are open, allowing in sunlight at the far end, to which the team proceeds and angles the camera outside. The view of the city is astonishing. This building is one of the tallest visible, but certainly not alone in its stature. The city below is gray and silent. No evidence of life at this altitude. Some buildings in the city have a strange brown growth that appears to be splashed against them as if a gelatinous mass was flung and then seeped down before hardening. Other buildings have floors where the glass has been shattered and the same brown substance is seeping out the edges. One member of the team calls the camera bearer to the windows on the other side. From the other side of the building, the city edges can be seen. Attention is pointed towards an expressway that encircles the city, upon which crawls another of the large half-body humanoids, dragging itself with its elastic arms, as witnessed in previous tests. It travels the highway, then moves out of sight. The team returns to the elevator and notes that a button has already been activated for floor 74. No one has approached the elevator, so the team agrees to travel to this floor. On the 74th floor, the doors open and reveal a waiting area to what appears to be a doctor's office. At the reception desk, there is a sign-in sheet with a series of names and dates. The dates on the sign-in sheet all carry the year 1953. A PC at the receptionist area is on and functioning at a user desktop. The background for the PC is a large set of praying hands with the word Faithful OS under them. On the desktop are a series of folders with years on them containing files that, when clicked using the center button of the mouse, open to a word viewer. All files appear to be appointment information. On the desk is a notepad titled, From the Desk of Dr. Borisiski, Blessed Purificationist. The door to the doctor's area is sketched with the same name and title as well as a crucifix. Opening this door leads to a white, dust-free hallway that has two examination rooms and a key-coded door at the end. The examination rooms are unremarkable and typical of any doctor's office. All medicine cabinets are empty. A small amount of C4 is placed at the lock to the key-coded door at the request of control and then blown, forcing the door open. The area it opens into is much larger than the reception area itself, and seems to contain a series of large containment capsules. There are a total of six of these capsules. Two are broken and a brownish amber material coats the floor coming from them. One is empty. The last three have nude humans floating in them with breathing masks. Attached to the front of these tubes are medical charts showing vital signs and conditions. For symptoms, the charts explain in somewhat awkward English ailments that seem more like flaws of personality or character, or just incidents that have occurred with the patient. Control asks for a zoom of one of the patient pages on the chart. After focusing, it reads, Citizen Jennifer McZerka did suffer a lapse of the heart that did lead her to lay with her neighbor twice upon nights of her husband's departure from their home. Patient did submit herself into the Lord's and our hands for cleansing of mind and body. 
prayer administered by High Father Uolakan and patient submitted to a three-day period in the Lord's Tears to cleanse her system, then released in good spirits. The topmost page reads, Citizen Alberius Farafan struck out at a High Father during a sermon, blaspheming that the Lord's tears did turn his daughter to be unright in mind and heart, thusly laying blame for her whorish activities at the feet of the High Father and his blessing. With no proof of these blasphemes, the forgiving judge and the punishing judge did agree that Alberius Farafan should bathe in the Lord's tears himself for a week, to be cleansed of mind and soul, thus to prove his daughter's ways are fault of not the father's hands, and to give him peace of self. Subject who has been traveling quietly with the escort team now begins to panic. The camera pans to focus on him, and he is surrounded by entities similar to those witnessed in the first two tests. Escort team reports in that Subject is having a panic attack, but Control requests them to stand still and wait. Subject screams at the entities which are denied to exist by Team Commander, stating Subject is alone in the corner. Control requests that one team member be dispatched to approach and recover the subject. The escort team member approaches the subject as ordered. On the video, the figures part to make a pathway for the approaching member, who lifts subject to his feet and brings him out of the corner. Figures on video are then seen closing ranks to close the path. Subject is lifted to his feet by an arm and escorted through the figures that close their ranks when the subject is moved. They remain steadfastly staring at the subject no matter where he moves to. Control requests the team to return now. Team turns to leave. Before leaving, a team member mentions something noticed at the reception desk. A binder labeled The Lord's Tears. Control requests binder be returned as well, and it is stowed into subject's field kit. The team returns to the elevator and returns to the ground floor. Upon leaving the building, Subject points down the street towards the direction of entry point. The camera pans to a section of raised expressway across which one of the large torsos is crawling slowly. The entity turns its featureless head to look at the escort team, raises its head to the sky, and emits a bellowing sound. Team leader issues the order to move, heading for the spot marked by the wireless video receiver. The creature on the expressway extends an arm down that stretches to touch the ground, before the camera moves to the port. All team members save one move through entry point. Subject moves through entry point and mirror returns to reflective surface. SCP-093 is dropped by Subject who panics and tries to fight his way out of the room. Subject is terminated by team leader after he draws the field kit pistol. Team Leader requests Portal be reopened, but it takes several minutes to find someone who can hold SCP-093 and generate a similar color. When a matching color is displayed and applied to the mirror, the video receiver is visible and all individuals report a horrific smell. Team Leader moves through the entryway with the control person. The uniform and possessions of the escort team member who was left behind are present and recovered but the member himself is nowhere to be seen and does not respond to shouts. Member assumed KIA and wireless receiver recovered. Control and escort return through entry point and mirror returns to reflective surface. Later review of the recovered camera shows escort member grasping at the air where the entry point should be and then turning around to look up at the oversized torso. A brown gel seems to drip off the creature as it moves that disappears shortly after being dislodged as if evaporating. Several shots are fired at the creature's face with the automatic weapon carried by that land in the face of the creature, causing a spray of less viscous brown liquid to pour forth from the wounds. Screams obscenities as the face of the creature descends upon him and the camera is pushed to the ground. Camera feed remains dark for approximately 65 seconds before light comes back and the camera films the creature crawling back to the expressway and pulling itself onto it, then crawling in the direction it was originally headed. Believed to have been absorbed by the creature and perhaps digested. 
This may have been an example of how these unknown entities feed by direct contact with living material. Further study is recommended to be avoided on this issue. Returned ledger filed as... Violet Test Office Ledger The third test with SCP-093 resulted in the unfortunate loss of a security member but also allowed us to recover a ledger with insight into the medical procedures carried out on the alternate Earth, now termed E-093. Patient Jennifer McZerka Recovery Tube 001-1 Mixture 35% Tears 30% Nutrient 10% HFT 25% Blessing Summary Jennifer McZerka is 20 cycles of age and during her 18th cycle was the victim of a hoverite accident that resulted in brain damage and misalignment of her moral processes. She is prone to violent outbursts and can only be calmed down by impure stimulation. Because of this, she actively seeks out strangers to mingle with and her parents have requested of the High Father that she be set to the tears to mend her mind and body. Patient accepted. During preparation for the tears, subject went into a rage and the attending hand went to recover a sedative. Jennifer tore her clothes off and screamed impure words at me, so I locked the door and instructed the hand to wait outside. I am half shameful to admit I laid with Jennifer a total of seven times before putting her to the tears. It has been very long for me and her parents have abandoned her to our care, so care for her I will. Before setting her to the tears, I authorized a blessed probe of her body functions and found she is settled now with young and tests confirm it shall be mine. I have mixed her bath to accommodate this and she will soak in the tears until her body is ready to give life. Patient. None. Recovery tube. 001-2. Mixture. None. Summary. None. Patient. Alberius Farafan. Recovery tube 001-3. Mixture. 80% tears, 20% nutrient. Summary. Alberius Farafan is a farmer from outside the city of Silver Feathers who claims to have lost family to the unclean. He confronted the High Fathers of the city and demanded compensation and retribution for the loss. The High Fathers denied the existence of unclean beyond the unfertile lands and refused compensation or retribution. Alberia struck a High Father and was arrested and sentenced to a cleansing of the soul. His mixture is primarily tears to seep into the soul and cleanse his heart and ease his pain. The lawkeepers state his family is indeed missing, so his sentence beyond the tears has been dropped in sympathy for their loss. I used the last of the HFT on Jennifer, or I would have used less tears on his bath. 80% is higher than I am comfortable with, but the HFT is becoming hard to obtain. I may have to go through the dark. Patient Recovery Tube 002-1 Mixture, 75% Nutrient, 25% Blessing Summary A member of the Blessed Militia who was wounded in combat. Request is from the High Father. Details withheld. Patient Recovery Tube 002-2 Mixture, 75% Nutrient, 25% Blessing Summary a member of the Blessed Militia who was wounded in combat. Request is from the High Father. Details withheld. Patient. Recovery Tube 002-3 Mixture. 75% Nutrient, 25% Blessing Summary. A member of the Blessed Militia who was wounded in combat. Request is from the High Father. Details withheld.